Welcome to the Breakfast Leadership Show, where we interview global thought leaders on business, leadership, and life. Here's your host, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and chief burnout officer of the Breakfast Leadership Network, Michael Levitt. Welcome back. I've got Aaron Alfini on the line. Aaron, how are you? I'm good, Michael. How are you? I am awesome. Really looking forward to this conversation. So for those that aren't aware of who you are, could you share a little bit about you and then we'll dive into the conversation? Sure. I am a technology adoption consultant and I help companies uh, surf what I call the tech tsunami, which is the exponential increase in the rate of innovation in the world that companies have a hard time uh, dealing with. And it's, it's getting worse as time goes on. So I help them build the right mindset, uh, find and retain the right people, usher out people that don't fit so well, and then help refine their processes that hinder technology adoption. So it goes more smoothly. They increase revenue and decrease costs. Yeah, I'm guessing over the last couple of years, that tsunami has been pretty gigantic because there are a lot of people that had to realize, oh, wait, everybody has to go home. How are we going to do this work? We don't have any tech. What's Zoom? You know, all these things. Yeah. So it's, I'm sure the last few years have been even a bigger challenge for a lot of organizations. Yeah, there's been a lot of forced innovation required um, because of COVID. Um, and a really good example of the tsunami is restaurants during COVID. The ones that couldn't get off paper tickets and get on DoorDash and all the electronic POSs and online ordering, they vaporized in a matter of months. And the ones that were able to, they not only survived, but they thrived. I mean, there's a local restaurant by me where they, uh, it's a sushi place, and they went from one chef now to three because they still have so many takeout orders. So, I mean, it just blew up their business because they were able to adopt and, and change yeah, my brother lives by a Mexican restaurant that used to be dine in type of situation. Then the pandemic hit, and then they were able to, you know, do the online ordering things. And even now, they they're not having indoor seating. They went, no, we're we're making so much money doing it this way. We're not going to bother doing that anymore. So it's you know the opportunities were there, and obviously the the restaurants that were able to implement those types of things really, really, really made a big, big difference. So you got a book, Harness the Juice. Let's let's talk about that. I always ask authors, you know, what in the world made you want to give up so much of your life and time to write a book? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, I've been in tech for 27 years and I've noticed this acceleration of innovation. And so like in the book, I actually go back millions of years and it took 2 million years for somebody to put a handle on a hammer which just blows my mind because it's something that we consider so obvious, right? Uh, And then from the prolific use of fire to the advent of the Chinese match, not even the friction match that we know and love, that was 400,000 years. And then you look at like CPUs, the first CPU in 1970 had 2,300 transistors. The latest iPhone has over 15 billion and that's only a 50 year time sprint. Uh, So everything's starting to go faster and faster. And technology begets technology. And I've been doing technology adoption with all these companies for so long. And I've noticed these recurring patterns from moving from mainframes to server workstations, servers to virtualization, virtualization to the cloud. It's always the same stories behind the scenes. You've got people that are resistant to change. You've got horrible processes that resist change. and I decided that you know, with, with the way that things are going, there, there's going to be a big problem with a lot of companies unable to adopt, and they're going to be hit hard and slaughtered in maybe months or years. Uh, so I wanted to create this book to get the message out and highlight to people you know, how fast this is going and where the, this is the, the hockey stick exponential curve. And we're kind of right at that bottom right now. We got all this AI going on. We have robotics. I mean, uh, Bugatti is even 3D printing their brake calipers now because they're lighter and stronger than cast or machined. 
And uh, it's happening everywhere. It's accelerating everywhere. And companies are just going to be kind of caught off guard. So that was the whole purpose of the book. No, it's an amazing book, and it's it it it, it tells the story of you know uh, you know like you gave the story about the handle on the hammer to the you know how many you know, components are in an iPhone, and you know the power of an iPhone is more powerful than what we used to blast off rockets to go to the moon. So it's you know it's one of those things where it's just we keep doubling up on that, and organizations that don't do it much like your restaurant analogy they're going to be vaporized and this is a stat that i saw the other day about the fortune 500 companies 52 percent of the fortune 500 companies from the year 2000 are either gone or were acquired so over half of the fortune 500 and that that's the most 500 most you know worth you know revenues all that in the planet are gone or we're merged into somebody else so a, a, you know company says ah we don't have to worry about that if the big boys have to you have to so uh, you're gonna have to get with it and and realize you know the opportunity and it's you know 2023 at the time of this recording if you're not using tech um you're you're really you're running a risk of uh, being phased out as far as you know, your business being able to grow or, or withstand business. Absolutely. That's a really interesting stat. I was unaware of that, but it's really, you know, that people always say like too big to fail and that's not a thing. <laughs> now it is being too big is probably one of the leading indicators that you will fail because the bigger an organization gets, the more process gets stacked on top of each other and the less their ability to change. Um, in my book, I talk about, you know, Sears, which really is kind of a mind boggling story from my perspective, because Sears, they invented the catalog, you know, they, they made a new model where you could get buy anything almost, you could get a house kit, you could buy a lawnmower, you could buy buggies, wagons, like, it was all available in the Sears catalog. And then you fast forward like 100 years, Amazon pretty much did the exact same thing but online and obliterated Sears, even though they, you know, when you think about it, they kind of pioneered the model in a different medium. And, uh, you know, these big companies are really going to have a hard time, you know, especially with, you know, like AI, like if you're not adopting AI right now in your business, or at least playing with it, learning how you're going to use it, that's what's really going to hurt you here in the near future, because, the companies that do are going to be able to turn out 10 times the amount of work that you can. And it's not going to replace everybody, but it's going to replace a lot of people. Yeah, I was in a conference. This was, I think, 2018. And they had, this was even before you know the conversations of AI, although I'm sure they existed. Um, but they said 25% of the jobs that exist today in 2018 would be eliminated by 2030. And that's not because of economic downturns or recessions or anything like that. It's just a quarter of the jobs will be obsolete. They're just going to be phased out. So... Yeah. Uh, get on board with with AI. You know, go to YouTube University. You know, it's just watch watch stuff. Get up to speed on it. Learn how to use it. Be, play around with it. It's a play box. You know, it's just get creative. Think about things. Go okay. Well, how can we do things more efficiently? And like you said, you know, cranking out. You know, and having things do more things. Whether it's you know a framework for a proposal or you know people use it for marketing and branding and obviously term papers you know that's you know the professors aren't too happy about that but that that's uh, not to make any students mad at me but that's where the pop quiz comes in professor and you'll actually see if they actually are consuming it or they're just using ai to it because if they bomb on the tests and the assignments are great but they bomb on the test they're not studying it and as a student you probably want to take a look at what you're studying because the whole purpose is to learn something and if you're using ai just to generate okay great so you learned how to use that but if you're going into a particular field like forensic accounting or other things but again the, the, as you mentioned there's a lot of fields that they could leverage ai 
to do things. And, you know, even in auditing, for example, my original career was accounting. So I could see where they could leverage AI to do more of a, a random scan of journal entries or posts or things like that to find any anomalies and or just to make sure that, you know, the, the flow of how they do accounting is in fact how they're supposed to do it. And so there's, you know, that's just one industry and one particular part of it. So uh, it's, it's a great tool. I love using it for a lot of different things because it's just like, okay, this is going to save me time. Or sometimes I'll just, you know, instead of going to Google, I'll, I'll throw it in there and I'll ask something about that. And it'll give me a nice little write up about it. So it's, it's, it's a great thing. Um, I, I enjoy it, but I, like you, I highly encourage people to get on board and start looking at it. So um, in your book too, you, you talk about um, creativity and how that is so important for culture and and workplaces and IT and all of that. So love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think creativity is what's really going to set companies apart in the future when everything's running so quickly, because you're going to need differentiators that set you apart. And the only way to do that is to have a creative mindset and then ability to implement those changes quickly and effectively to get it out in the marketplace. Uh, you know, we already see with, um, you know, ChatGPT came out in November, and then there's this quick rush from Amazon, from Google to come up with competing products, you know, very quickly and that quick pivot. And then you just can't copy it right? You've got to do something a little extra to get people to come over. And that's where that creativity comes in, you know, having people that can come up with those ideas. AI ultimately, and people will probably, you know, freak out when I say this, is that AI can't really create from scratch. It's still mimicry, it was trained on all this, you know, material that humans created. So it doesn't, it's, it's still mimicry. It still can't, it doesn't have a consciousness. It still can't spontaneously create, right? Um, you can't get drunk like Hermes, Ernest Hemingway and then write amazing books. Um, it'd be funny to see though, <laughs> but uh, it's not there. So we need that human creativity to to fill those gaps. And that's ultimately where I think most people will end up is between that creative sector and uh, services, because services are going to be really hard to replace, like putting a new roof on my house or, you know, getting a massage or, you know, waiting tables, even though that's even kind of being replaced with robots now. Another sushi place I have has a robot that brings your order out to you now. Yeah, you know, we've seen that in certain markets too, even with the uh, food delivery, where it's, uh, you know, basically it's a little robotic vehicle and you go in there and you enter a code and you open it up and it says, you know, here's your bag of whatever you ordered. So, yeah, there's going to be things like that. But then I, we've seen this over the history of humanity where, oh no, jobs are getting eliminated. Yes, but guess what? Jobs are being created. And I think that's where it's important, especially for, younger people or people that are looking to switch careers it's like okay look what's in demand and what will likely be in demand over the next few years and and skill yourself up on those things and you'll make a big difference in in your career and uh you'll obviously be really valuable because you're going to be providing a service that organizations need uh even you know i see i'm seeing this a lot now a lot of companies are scrambling just to find people that know ai and say okay let's let's bring them in um and but you know the key thing, and I know this is another thing you talk about, is uh, there's you know a big difference because a lot of people group these together. But there's a big difference between being efficient and being effective. And I, a lot of times gr- people group those things together, but those are different things. So, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I see that a lot in business in general. Is they're always looking for the efficiency, and you can always be doing the wrong things really well. And it's really hard for people to, you know, kind of get around that. A lot of times they treat the symptom rather than treating the root cause. So they're very efficient at treating the symptom, but they would be better if they looked at, you know, why is this happening? And then 
work on that effectiveness instead. So that's a that's a really common common business business issue. And and on the topic of the jobs being created versus destroyed, I agree there will be new jobs, but I think we're getting to the first position in our history where jobs are going to be obliterated faster than created. You know, a lot of people, and even Gary V is like, well, tractors, you know, everybody thought that tractors are going to put all the farmers out of business and they found new jobs, which is true. But it took decades for tractors to become horrific. I mean, even my dad still had horses pulling plows, right? Um, and then there are big pieces of machinery that need people to build, repair, deliver, sell these pieces of machinery. And so it took, you know, there's lots and lots of jobs created. But when you look at like ChatGPT, where they went from a million users to now over 100 million users, it's not like OpenAI went and hired a million employees, right? So the, with software and technology, you get a lot more scale than you would with a lot of the things that have been done in previous history. And that's where I think we're going to struggle is because the rate at which these things gobble up jobs is going to be significant. Like I would not want to be a paralegal right now because a lot of their work is like looking up case law and, and uh, studies and previous uh, uh, court proceedings. And AI can do that in a matter of seconds and it can do it way more effectively than you know, an intern or, you know, somebody fresh out of college could ever hope to do it. And so a lot of those jobs, I think, are going to get hit hardest uh, right off the bat. You know, your accounting example is a good thing. AI can probably reconcile better than humans can and way faster, reduce errors. Um, There's so many and even long haul truckers, you know, a lot of people like self driving cars. Well, self driving cars are complicated because you're on city streets and there's kids and balls and dogs and all these things. But long haul hucker, tr- long haul truckers, you know, they leave their depot, they get on the interstate, they drive for 15 hours, they get off the interstate, stop at a depot, and drop off a truck. That's an easy problem to solve from an AI perspective of going down a you know, a highway, most likely divided, where there's not all these other things involved that I need to accommodate for. So I think that's probably going to be one of the places that gets displaced soonest. And it gives us, you know, opportunity to, you know, with the self-driving vehicles and uh, even, you know, short range where, and again, this is where jobs could come into play where they go, you know what, let's, we, we can build, a few more depots along the way, especially if it's uh, an electric truck that doesn't have as much capacity at this point, we could see that, you know, there might be a time where, you know, they get more, uh, more miles out of the battery type of thing. And they mimic uh, what, you know, diesel powered uh, trucks are giving. Uh, But I I see there's opportunities to, you know, again, build more factories, which is going to be in all likelihood, a combination of robotics and people where I could see cranes and things like that, but someone's operating it or managing it. So it, there's just going to be some shifts of some things. But again, it just boils down to when you're growing up, okay, what jobs are available? You know, I'm sure most people right now that are, you know, in high school getting ready to go to college, they're not going to say, you know what, I'm going to be a blacksmith. I'm going to make horseshoes. Um, yes, they still make them. Uh, but you know, much like a factory now and, you know, very automated. So it's, again, it's just what jobs are available. What are the skills they need to learn to do that train on that? And again, access to education has never been easier for us because again, there's so many online things and, uh, courses and, you know, one of the things that I think I, I hate saying that there was a, you know, well, there was positives, I guess, that came out of the pandemic, but one of them was that it did accelerate some things um, that were probably well due to happen, but people, of course, are very resistant to change and it forced it on them. And, you know, many organizations were able to pivot pretty quickly, painfully, I'm sure, but it was still able to pivot uh, to be able to 
get people working remotely, get systems in place, and be able to continue to produce the products and services for their customers uh, without much of a hiccup in many cases. So I, I always commend organizations to celebrate that because I know it wasn't easy for for most of us. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of technology changes, you know, from remote desktops, Zoom, obviously, um, just remote management of staff. There's tons of tooling out there now to help manage staff, you know, remotely and make sure that, you know, employees are doing one-to-ones and stuff like that. Um, there's just been a, a huge amount of forced innovation, which, um, you know, it, it weeds out the, the weak companies, that's for sure. Because the ones that can't, they they disappear rather quickly. Yeah, and, and I'm not to get political on this or something. I, I think it's healthy for uh, weak organizations to not be saved per se, um, because if they're not strong enough to be able to navigate through things, um, then maybe they should. Um, fail and then they can find something else to produce that they'll be successful in. Um, it just because it, uh, otherwise we, we're just watering down what the offerings are out there. And, and as a society, we don't get great stuff. So uh, it's definitely a good point to, to focus on. So Aaron, love this conversation. Where can people find out more about you, your book and all this amazing work you're doing? Sure. I mean, they can find my book on amazon.com. Of course, harness the juice. You can also get a free chapter at harnessthejuice.com. Uh, just uh, sign up with your email and you can get the first chapter for free. And you can check out, uh, you know, people that want to take action right away, they can check me out at aaronalfini.com and uh, schedule a time and book a call. There you go. And I'll definitely have all that information in the show notes. So, Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate you and I love the work you do. So, thank you yeah. again. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Thanks for listening to The Breakfast Leadership Show, part of the Breakfast Leadership Network. Visit breakfastleadership.com for tips on empowering your business and your life.